I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to class this morning. Um, you should have in front of you a set of notes for uh, Lesson 95. And the name of uh, Lesson 95 is John Wycliffe and the First Complete English Bible. Okay, John Wycliffe and the First Complete English Bible. So um, next Sunday, I'm not going to be here. Um, I'm going to be in New Mexico at the uh, conference there at, in uh, Taos, New Mexico with uh, Dave Reed. And um, I believe Bud is going to be teaching the adult Sunday school next week. So we will have class, but it will be uh, somebody else teaching. So we're going to be starting a, a talk about Wycliffe today. And um, just kind of give you my thoughts on this. Wycliffe is a pretty important person. Um, not only when it comes to the issues of the Bible and so forth that we've been studying about in this class, uh, but also in just world history in general, okay? As we'll see in a minute, uh, Wycliffe is commonly referred to as the morning star of the Reformation. So he predates Luther and Calvin and the, um, the thinkers and writers and theologians that we mostly associate with the Reformation by over a hundred years, okay? And so he's commonly referred to as the morning star of the Reformation, but his Bible is significant. So what I want to do today is I want to look at Wycliffe the person and understand his career and his beliefs, okay? Then when we come back from being gone next week, then I want to talk about the, his translation specifically. And there's a lot of things about his translation that we need to identify. What commonly happens in classes like this is people just sort of mention Wycliffe and that he's the first one to translate the Bible into English out of Latin, and then they sort of move on. They don't really explain anything or look at any of this stuff, and it's important to look at because um, the, his Bible, the Wycliffe Bible, has an impact on the English language and an enduring impact on the English language, and it sets the stage for what's going to happen in the 1500s or the 16th century. So there's definitely some things here that we want to make sure that we're understanding and not just glossing over for the sake of speed. Okay. So introduction. Last week in lesson 94, we looked at the history of the English language and its or and the excuse me and the origins of the Anglo-Saxon Gospels. In doing so, we discussed the following three time periods in the development of the English language. Okay. And I rewrote them up here. So the first one is Old English. Old English is that period from the 6th century or the 500s through to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. This is where last Sunday we looked at the Anglo-Saxon translation of the Gospels, right? So the Anglo-Saxon is going to fit there, and we looked at different early attempts to translate the Bible into Anglo-Saxon and so forth. Then the next period is the Middle English period from roughly 1100 to 1500, this is the period in which Wycliffe is going to translate. Whoops. The Wycliffe translation is going to fit this time period. Most people date it from somewhere in the 1380s. So Wycliffe is going to be here, and then obviously we have the modern English period. I tried to tell you last Sunday that the King James Bible technically is modern English. Okay? Um, it is not Old English, it is not Middle English, it is technically Modern English. It is Early Modern English is what it is, okay? <laughs> so the old forms of speaking that you hear when you read a King James Bible are not Middle English, they're not Old English, those are technically Modern English, and we'll talk about all that stuff uh, in due time. So, it was during the Old English period that the first translations into Anglo-Saxon, a rudimentary form of English, were made. Over the next couple of lessons, we want to turn our attention to the state of the English Bible during the Middle English period. So, starting today, we're going to start looking at this period in here, the Middle English period, with Wycliffe. Okay? In order to accomplish this, we need to understand the life and ministry of John Wycliffe. Now, you'll see his name spelled a bunch of different ways. I have probably ten books at home that spell it eight ways. If you look it up, depending on the era of when the book was written, you're going to see all sorts of different spellings of Wycliffe. A lot of them only have one F. Um, some of them, I, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. But this is how I'm going to spell it. This is the way most people spell it in uh, modern spelling. Okay. So before turning our attention, oh, I, I got ahead of myself. We need to understand the life and ministry of John Wycliffe. 
the individual credited for first translating the entire Bible into English and kindling the flames of the Reformation. Before turning our attention to Wycliffe, please recall the following summary points regarding the state of the English Bible before Wycliffe. So this would have been what we looked at last week. I've just reproduced a few points, okay? Number one, the earliest portions of the, of the Scripture in Anglo-Saxon were songs set to verse. So remember we talked about how they took the Psalms particularly and they tried to set them to a, a rhythm and a meter so that they could be sung, okay? And those were some of the first portions of Scripture to be translated into Anglo-Saxon. Number two, the first known translation of an actual biblical text into Old English was a portion of the Psalter, or Psalms, which dates from the beginning of the 8th century or the 700s. Unfortunately, no copies of this Psalter are known to be extant. Now, we know about it because writings have survived that speak about this psalm, this group of psalms translated into Anglo-Saxon as having existed. So we don't have any extant copies of this earliest translation of the psalms, but we do have things that have survived where people were talking about them being available in Anglo-Saxon. Okay? Number three, the Old English period to A.D. 1066 is characterized by its interlinear glosses in Latin manuscripts. Glossing, an Anglo-Saxon pedagogical method for introducing Latin to the reader, placed a word-for-word -word vernacular translation in direct juxtaposition to the Latin text. The Lindensfarne manuscript is a prime example. Later scribes drew from these glosses to craft their translations. So you remember we talked about that last Sunday, right? I wrote, I just wrote the word Latin on the board. So a gloss would be stating above each line what that Latin word was in what language? Anglo-Saxon. Anglo okay, we talked about that last week. And then fourth, the 10th century translation of the four Gospels into Old English was known as the Wessex Gospels. Um, you might also hear that referred to as the West Saxon Gospels or something along those lines, okay? Uh, is the first extended portion of the Bible into English. The Wessex Gospels is anonymous uh, as to uh, is anonymous and does not bear a date so in other words we don't know exactly when it was done and we don't know exactly who did it or what group or individual did it the earliest known manuscripts date from the 12th century okay and then last the pre wycliffe period epitomized the notion that only the clergy could own and read the scriptures the clergy not only prevented the laity from reading the scriptures, copies of the sacred text were simply not available. They were either not in the laity's language or they were too expensive to purchase. Thus, the use of the Bible by the poor was not possible until the end of the 14th century. Okay, So the end of the 14th century is roughly this time period. Who's going to reverse that trend? Wycliffe and his group, the Lollards, which we're going to learn about here uh, in a moment. All right. So, does anybody have any questions or comments about the review? Okay. So, point number one: Who was John Wycliffe? John Wycliffe is commonly referred to as the Morning Star of the Reformation. The earliest part of Wycliffe's life <clears throat> is involved in much obscurity. But the general opinion is that he was born of humble parentage in the neighborhood of Richmond in Yorkshire about the year 1324. Okay, so we have to be clear that some of the life of Wycliffe is not wholly known, um, but we can gather certain things from, th uh, from, from evidence that has survived history. Okay, his destination was that of a scholar to which he was informed the humblest in those days could inspire. England was, England was almost a land, England was almost a land of schools, every cathedral, almost every monastery having its own, but youths of more ambition, self-confidence, supposed capacity, and of better opportunities thronged to Oxford and Cambridge. Okay? So if you were anyone, uh, anyone that was anyone in England at the time, in the intelligentsia, if you will, wanted to go where? Oxford and Cambridge, okay? I would submit to you that that is probably still the same today. The most prestigious universities in Great Britain are still Oxford and what? Cambridge. 
Cambridge. and Cambridge. Okay. In fact, they have long-standing rivalry and so forth with each other. Wycliffe found his way to Oxford. He was admitted a student at Queen's College, but soon removed to Merton College, the oldest, the wealthiest, and most famous of the Oxford foundations. People get confused about this all the time. What's the difference between a college and a university? A university has a bunch of colleges inside it. Yeah. A university is a collection of what? Colleges. Colleges. So when you hear about King's College, Cambridge, or you hear about um, Queen's College, or Merton College, or any of this sort of thing, those are smaller colleges within the what? Mm -hmm. The university. Okay? Now, that's the way it used to be. In our day, a university is more probably accurately defined as an institution offering advanced degrees. Okay? So if you are a college, you typically are only able to legally issue a bachelor's degree. If you are a university, it means that you are having the, you've been approved to issue graduate level degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, that sort of thing, okay? But back here, this is kind of more the way uh, university and colleges were structured back then. I've, I've, I've talked to you guys about this before, right? A professor has to have a level of education higher than the one that the students are currently earning, right? So for example, I have a master's degree. Could I teach undergraduate level history at a college or university? No. Yes, but could I teach graduate level students? Shouldn't. I mean, I probably could, but I wouldn't let me because I don't have a what? PhD. PhD, okay? Anyway, that's all for the worth the price of tea in China, okay? So it was supposed that he, so I'm in the middle of that point, it was supposed that he, that's Wycliffe, was privileged to attend the lectures of the very pious and profound Thomas uh, Brad, Bradwardine. Bradwardine, and that from his works he derived his first views of the freeness of grace and the utter worthlessness of all human merit in the matter of salvation, okay? So Wycliffe is going to latch on very early on to the idea that people are saved how? By grace. By grace okay? That human effort and performance is not what saves a person. Now obviously is that going to put him at odds with eventually with the Catholic Church? Okay? According to his biographers, Wycliffe soon became a master of civil canon and municipal law with his greatest efforts being reserved for the study of theology. So technically he is a lawyer. Okay, you see that in a minute. It was not an easy endeavor. The sacred text was neglected and the scholastic divinity had taken the place of the authority of the scripture. So when Wycliffe is involved in all of this, the church canon law and the church authority is over scripture and, and Wycliffe is gonna to come to the belief that that shouldn't be the case. <clears throat> Bruce Shelley, author of Church History in Plain Language, concurs with Miller's portrayal of Wycliffe's early life. Shelley writes, quote, Wycliffe's early life is as obscure as his personality. We are not even sure of his date of birth. He was reared in Northern England by only, he was, re he was reared in Northern England, but only emerges from the medieval mists as a student at Oxford. He secured his doctorate's degree in 1372 and rose immediately to prominence as a leading professor at the university. So in other words, most of about what we know of him is coming from his career at Oxford. Okay? The following is a brief summary of the major events of Wycliffe's career at Oxford. At Oxford, Wycliffe's fame stemmed from defending the university against the encroachments of the Dominican Franciscan, Augustinian, and Carlamentia friars who were enticing students into their orders without the consent of their parents. So this is what was happening. These are all, those, those names there, Dominican, Augustinian, and so forth, those are Catholic monastic orders, okay? What they were doing was they were enticing young people to join these monasteries without those people getting the consent of their parents. Now the reason this became a problem for the university is the universities are competing for those same one. Those same young people to come not go to the, not go to the monastery but to come where? 
university. to the university. So Wycliffe's, Wycliffe is going to get involved in this, frankly, legal matter, if you want to see it that way. This practice was infecting enrollments at the universities, which saw a decline from 40,000 to 6,000 students. Publishing paper, papers titled Against the Beggary, Against Idle Beggary, and On the Poverty of Christ, Wycliffe charged these groups with 50 errors of doctrine and practice, as well as stealing from the poor. Since virtually every other university in Europe was facing the same problem from these arch deceivers, and the popes vigorously defended their efforts and bestowed them with great favor and privilege, Wycliffe's fame increased within Oxford as a great champion of the university. Is everybody following that point? Okay. Next, about the year 1366, a controversy had arisen between Pope Urban V and King Edward III. So this would have been the English king. In consequence of the reward of the renewed demand of the annual tribute of 1,000 marks, which King John had bound himself to pay to Rome, to pay to the Roman See, and an acknowledgment of the feudal superiority of the Roman pontiff over the kingdoms of England and Ireland. The payment of the so understand what's going on here, right? Is the Catholic Church exacting tribute from England? Yes. And are they expecting the kings of England and Ireland? to basically acknowledge the Pope as their superior, okay? <clears throat> the payment of the ignominious, is that right? Yeah. Ignominious. ignominious tribute had never been regular, but it had been entirely um, discontinued for 30 years. Urban demanded payment in full. Edward refused, declaring himself resolved to hold his kingdom in freedom and independence. Wycliffe was already one of the king's chaplains, was appointed to answer the papal arguments, and so effectively did he prove that canon and papal law has no force when it is opposed to the word of God, that the papacy from that day to this ceased to lay claim to the sovereignty of England. The arguments of Wycliffe were used by the lords in parliament uh, who unanimously resolved to maintain the independence of the crown against the pretension of Rome. So understand, a lot of what he's doing here at first is political. It's within the arena of politics. But he's so forcefully arguing his case here against the superiority of the pontiff and, and the Roman system over the king of England that he is gaining popularity as a result of this, right? So now he's not only viewed as a defender of the university, but he's also uh, highly revered in England as a defender of the crown against the claims of the Catholic Church, okay? Is everybody with that? <coughs> in the year 1372, Wycliffe was raised to the theological chair. This was an important step in the cause of truth and was used by the Lord. Being a doctor of divinity, he had the right of delivering lectures on theology. He spoke as a master to the young theologians at Oxford. Now look, you can be, a lot of fundamentalists are very negative towards education, okay? And I understand why they are, because they look at the numbers of, of people that have been spoiled by education and these kinds of things. But here you have a situation where you have a highly trained man arising to a position that gives him a pulpit of authority from which he can speak the word of God. And the, ch and the impact on the culture is going to be significant. You guys following that? Okay. The theory of the two swords, or the question of dominion or lordship over men, was a hotly debated topic in the later Middle Ages. Okay. Now we went over this in the Grace History Project. I did a whole lesson on this. Okay, um, the theory of the two swords was the idea that the Catholic pontiff, the Pope, had dominion over the religious world and also dominion over the political what? world. Okay, so this is a mindset that over time the Catholic Church adopts, that it not only was, it not only was given the authority in the earth by Christ religiously speaking, which obviously I disagree with, 
but it was also given authority in the earth, politically speaking. And it became known as the theory of the two swords. In other words, the, the Roman pontiffs wielded a spiritual sword and a what? Political sword, okay? While all thinkers, while all thinkers believe that lordship arose from God, there was disagreement over how it was transmitted to earthly rulers. The Catholic view was that God had entrusted the Pope with universal dominion over all temporal things and persons. Others insisted that lordship depended less on the mediation of the church than on the fact that its possessor was in a state of grace. That is, he continued, uh, he committed, excuse me, not grievous sin. So the Catholics are claiming this idea that they have indiscriminate, basically unlimited authority over, over not only religious, but also political matters. Wycliffe asserted that the English government had the divinely assigned responsibility to correct the abuses of the church within its realm and to relieve of office those churchmen who persisted in their sin. The state could even seize the property of corrupt church officials. So who is going to become enemy number one of Rome? Wycliffe, okay? He's, not only is he challenging the authority or the theory of the two swords, but he's saying that the English king has the authority to correct the abuses of the church in English-controlled territory. And that it could include even the seizing of church property, okay? <coughs> Although Wycliffe was widely known to hold anti-papal opinions, he had not yet committed direct opposition to Rome. In 1374, he was employed as an em uh, embassy to Pope Gregory XI, who had moved the papacy to Avignon, France. Upon his return to England, after witnessing firsthand the true nature of the papacy, Wycliffe began an open, direct, and force. Wycliffe became an open, direct, and forceful antagonist of Rome. Okay, so understand: Does he go there and witness what's going on firsthand? Yeah. When he comes home, is he totally changed? And now, he, now he's going to really ratchet up the, the the opposition here, right? Can I say that Luther did the same thing? Luther had been employed by the monastery. Luther had also been trained as a lawyer. Okay, um, and he got caught in this rainstorm and he basically made a deal that if God spared his life, he'd become a monk. So Luther goes to the monastery as a highly educated, trained lawyer and this just ticks his father off something fierce that Luther does this, right? Well, when the monastery had a legal complaint, they send Luther to Rome to present the case because Luther is a what? Lawyer. Is a lawyer. Well, when Luther comes back, when Luther goes to Rome, he sees all the corruption and the relics and the indulgences and all the stuff going on in Rome, and he comes back totally different than when he went, okay? Well, something similar happened to Wycliffe. You need to also understand that this is in a time period where there is a schism in the papacy, Okay, you can study this if you want to, but what happens is there is a dis there's a dispute within the Catholic Church about who the true Pope is. Okay, so one Pope, Urban here, or no, Gregory the the eleventh, he moves the papacy to Avignon, France. So you then now, now you have a situation where there are two popes, both of which are excommunicating each other. It's brilliant, brilliant system that that excommunication system. Okay. But utilizing his influence of his seat at Oxford, he published the deep convictions of his soul in learned lectures and disputations at Oxford, parish preaching, and spirited tracts written in clear English prose, which reached the humbler and less educated classes. In short, he denounced with a burning indignation the entire papal system. So what Wycliffe does is he goes to Avignon he witnesses what's going on. He comes back and does he start preaching against it? Yes. Not merely in Latin, but also in what? Middle English. Middle English. And he starts writing in Middle English in leaflets and tracts and pamphlets 
that now the common man is able to what? To read. Okay? Anybody got any questions? <clears throat> okay? So let's look at the next point. <coughs> the teachings of Wycliffe. <clears throat> in addition to his career at Oxford, Wycliffe preached weekly in the parishes explaining the word of God in the vernacular English. In this way, he planted deep in the popular mind those great truths and principles with eventually, which eventually led to the emancipation of England from the yoke of tyranny of Rome. Okay? Now, this is going to take a while for this to happen. It's going to take a while to matriculate through English society, but eventually, in the 1500s, it will happen. In his treatise, The Kingdom of God, and in other writings, he shows that, quote, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only source of true religion and that the scripture alone is truth. Okay? So that's an early understanding of sola scriptura, one of the hallmark doctrines of the Protestant Reformation or Revolution. Okay? So he understands that. The doctrine he called dominion established the fact of the personal relation and direct responsibility of each man to God. That would be what becomes known in the Reformation as the universal priesthood of all believers, right? The idea that as a, as a, as a child of God, I can go straight to God. I don't have to go through any what? Mediators, popes, Catholics, bishops, all this sort of stuff, okay? All authority, he thought, he taught, is from God, and all who exercise authority are responsible to God for the use of what he has committed to them. Such doctrine directly denying the prevailing ideas as to the uh, irresponsi ir yeah. irresponsible authority of popes and kings and the necessity for the mediatory powers of the priesthood um, arose violent opposition that was intensified when in 1381, Wycliffe published his denial of the doctrine of transubstantiation, thus striking at the root of the supposed miraculous power of the priests, which had so long enabled them to dominate Christendom. Here, his political supporters and even his own university forsook him. So when he starts questioning transubstantiation, that's when everybody that had been behind him starts saying, oh, wait a minute, you're too hot a potato now. We don't, we, we're not going to go there, okay? You've taken this thing too far. So you could see that they had a sort of a limit. They were willing to go with him. Bucking the prevailing Catholic orthodoxy of his day regarding the importance of, church, of the church fathers, councils, and papal decrees, Wycliffe reasoned that such things were valuable only to the extent that they were in agreement with Scripture. He saw a double, double source of Christian knowledge, reason and revelation, and found that these are not opposed to each other, but that reason or natural light has been weakened by the fall and therefore labors under a degree of imperfection, which God in his grace heals by imparting revealed knowledge through the scriptures. These therefore came to be apprehended as the exclusive authority." So understand what Wycliffe's saying. He's saying man fell into sin. God, he says, God created man with the ability to what? Think. think, to reason, right? Man fell into sin, and so his ability to think and reason has been corrupted, right? And so God's remedy for that was to reveal and write the what? Word the Word of God, right? So that the Word of God could be read and fill up and correct this thinking that has been destroyed or wounded by the fall, if you will, Okay. So you can see in those ideas, is putting the Bible into the common language going to be a natural consequence of what he's teaching here? Okay. Wycliffe taught that the Bible is the word of God or the will and testament of the Father. God and his God and his word are one. Christ is the author of Holy Scripture, which is his law. He himself is in the scripture to be ignorant of the scriptures was to be ignorant of Christ so what Wycliffe is saying is that the living and the written word are what one one 
The living word being who? Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The written word being what? The scriptures. We've studied that. You probably don't remember, but way back when we studied inspiration, I taught you how God's design and inspiration was to make the living word, the, word, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the living word what? One. One. Equal to each other, right? The same things that are said about Christ are said about the scriptures. We went over all that stuff, and I know you have a memory of that, right? Thank you. One of you, so. Alrighty, moving on. <laughs> Sylvia's always saying that she's glad there's no test. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Scripture is infallible, Wycliffe says. Other teachers, even one as great as Augustine, are liable to lead into error. To place above Scripture and prefer it, human traditions, doctrines, and ordinances is nothing but an act of blind presumption. As to the interpretation of Scripture, the theological doctors cannot have the power of interpretation for us, but the Holy Spirit teaches us the meaning of Scripture. As Christ opened the Scriptures to the apostles, scriptures, Scripture is to be interpreted by Scripture. Aha, uh -huh. so there we see another principle of comparing Scripture with what? Scripture. scripture. So you see how all these ideas are going to lead ultimately to the Reformation. Reading, uh, I think that should say regarding. Regarding the interpretation of Scripture, first, its primary and literal sense is to be taken, and then its further and figurative meaning. So it appears that Wycliffe is actually arguing for a principle of the literal what? Interpretation. Literal interpretation first and primarily, not figurative interpretation. Christ is the true man and true God, existing from all eternity. At his incarnation, he united both natures in one person. <coughs> his grandeur is incapable, his grandeur is incomparable, okay, as the only mediator between God and man, the center of humanity, our one and only head. He viewed the church not as the visible Catholic church, or organized community of the hierarchy, but as Christ's body and bride, consisting the whole number of the elect, having in the visible world only its temporary manifestation and pilgrimage. It home, should say its, its home, origin, and end being the invisible world in eternity. Again, so, you know, you might look at some of what he said, and be like, okay, maybe I don't quite agree with him on a few things, but by and large, is Wycliffe in cover, uh, re uh, uncovering significant light and understanding here, okay? Salvation, he said, is not dependent on the connection with the official church or the uh, mediation of the clergy. This is free, there is free, immediate access of all believers to the grace of God in Christ, and every believer is a priest. So again, priesthood of all believers, hallmark doctrine of the Reformation. Regarding the beliefs of Wycliffe, Bruce Shelley reports the following. He says, quote, In time, Wycliffe challenged the whole range of medieval beliefs and practices. Pardons, indulgences, absolution, pilgrimages, the worship of images, the adoration of the saints, the treasury of merit laid up at the reserve of the, of the Pope, the distinction between venial and mortal sins. He retained, he retained belief in purgatory and extreme unction, though he admitted that he looked in vain in the Bible for the uh, institution of extreme unction. Images, he said, if they increased the devotion, need not be removed, and prayers to saints were not necessarily wrong. Confession he held to be useful, provided it was voluntary and made to a suitable person. Best of all, if it were made in public. Compulsory confession, he considered the bondage of the Antichrist. Okay? So you look at that, and if we're going to be fair with Wycliffe, do we have to acknowledge that he still maintained some things that we today probably would be against? Okay? Now, <clears throat> I personally choose not to get mad at him about those things. Okay, I choose to try to understand the, his, the context of his day and his time and what he was coming out of. Then I choose to look at the great light that he had on those subjects that we just mentioned and not 
not really be too hard on him for those things that he didn't go far enough in that, that, that I would be against today. You guys following that? Okay. Um, I think sometimes people are, too, people are too hard on folks from the past because they don't properly understand the context in which they're operating and laboring. Okay. The stuff that he said was revolutionary for its day. Even though he didn't go far enough on some things. You could say the same thing about Luther and the other men a hundred years later. Okay? So anybody have any questions about his beliefs before we move on? So what I want you to see there is this. Is it, natu is it, a, is it a natural outflow of these beliefs that he would advocate for translating the Bible into English? Yeah. Yeah, it would be, okay? Because he thinks that the people need to have, they need to be able to read it and understand it in their own language, okay? <clears throat> Any questions? All right, let's look at the fate of Wycliffe. While still at Oxford in 1377, the Pope condemned much of Wycliffe's teaching. The church might have moved against him at that moment, but influential friends in England saw to it that the condemnation never went beyond threats. Again, here's another parallel with Luther. If you remember the story of Luther, you remember that when he falls under the excommunication of the Catholic Church, he is kidnapped by his friends and hidden away in Wartburg Castle. You remember that? Okay. So again, Wycliffe enjoys some protection from people that support him. Wycliffe also benefited from political infighting within the Catholic Church. In 1378, the Great Schism in the Papacy occurred, resulting in two popes each excommunicating each other. So in other words, <clears throat> does the Catholic Church have its own internal fighting going on? Like significant and big internal fighting uh, and so they're not really in a position to do anything about this guy up there in England, okay? So Wycliffe is going to benefit from the political situation <clears throat> within the Catholic Church. Wycliffe gained popular support. <clears throat> Wycliffe gained enough popular support. The church authorities had the good sense to not move against him. His followers, however, were hunted down, expelled from Oxford, and forced to renounce their views. Despite... Having been driven from the university, Wycliffe was left to close out his days in peace at his parish in Luterworth. He died of an apparent stroke in 1384. So it's told that he was in the middle of a church service when he was struck with some sort of stroke on the last day of the year in 1384. Apparently he had suffered a... Um, previous, what we would call stroke today, previous to that, that he had recovered from, but this one uh, takes his life in 1384. After his death in, 15, in 1415, the Council of Constance condemned Wycliffe on 260 different counts, ordered his writings to be burned, and directed that his bones be exhumed and cast out of consecrated ground. In 1428, a papal command, at the papal command, the remains of Wycliffe were dug up and burned, and his ashes were thrown into a nearby stream. That's, hey, because you can't, you can't bury, in Catholic doctrine, you cannot bury a heretic on holy what? Ground. So now that they have officially condemned him as a heretic, they literally dig up his remains, burn them in a fire, and chuck his ashes in the river. That's how mad at him they are. Okay? Well, that gives you a sense of what the stakes were here. Okay? About well, 40 years later. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's about, they carry that grudge for 40 years. There. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's rough. So that council rules in um, 1415, right? Yeah. In 1517, Luther's going to post his 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. Okay, so nearly 100 years later, Luther is going to take this big time. And there's a major difference, though, between the timing here, between Luther and, between Wycliffe and Luther. Anybody know what it is? The press. The press. 
The printing press is invented in the 1450s by um, Gutenberg, okay? When Luther publishes his 95 theses to the door of the church, he writes them in Latin because he intends for them to be a, a uh, scholarly dialogue amongst the professors and, and students of the university, right? But somebody took them off the door, translated them into German, and printed 10,000 of them on a, uh, in German on a printing press, and before you know it, all Germany is in an uproar, Okay. So there's significant differences between Luther and, and between Wycliffe and Luther, most notably is the printing press. Okay, that technology changed the game, right? The Catholic because right now uh, everything that Wycliffe is doing has to be copied by what? Hand. Does it take a long time to do that? Especially in the case of entire Bibles. Okay? So now if he's going to set the text to English and all these are going to be hand copies. If the Catholic Church gets their hands on a significant number of lollards and executes them and burns their writings, that's going to wipe out a whole bunch of their what? A whole bunch of their Bibles. The difference between that and what happened with Luther is the Catholic Church could not have destroyed all the writings of Luther, even if they wanted to, because they had been so massively set to the press and spread all over Germany. And then they're translated into other European languages and published there in, on presses. And before you know it, does the Catholic Church have a major problem on their hands? You guys following all that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions before we move on? <clears throat> you know, people talk today about something going viral. Right? A video on YouTube or something on Facebook or social media. Right? Well, it, it, it went viral. Luther invented going viral. Okay? He did. In, 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 in a real sense. So the Lollards <clears throat> spread the teachings of Wycliffe. According to Miller, Wycliffe organized no sect during his life, but the power of his teaching was manifest in the number and zeal of his disciples after his death. From the hunt of the peasant, from the hut of the peasant, excuse me, to the palace of royalty, there were to be, they were to be found everywhere under the vague name of Lollards. Crowds gathered to hear their preachers. <clears throat> His ideas, Wycliffe, that's referring to Wycliffe's ideas, inspired a group in England known as the Lollards. A term of abuse, meaning mumblers, who were fiercely persecuted by church authorities. So just, just think that through for a minute. So are these lollards out preaching? Mm -hmm. Right? They're out preaching in the streets, they're preaching wherever they can, you know, wherever people will listen to them, right? And their enemies label them as what? Mumblers. Mumblers. Because all they're doing is what? Preaching. So it's a derogatory term. It's a derogatory term that is hung on them by their opponents. It is not a term that they claim for who? Themselves. themselves. Okay? So a term of abuse meaning mumblers who are firstly persecuted by the church authorities. According to Shelley, for, quote, from Oxford, Wycliffe sent out poor priests into the byways and village greens, sometimes even to churches, to win the souls of the neglected. Clad in russet robes of undressed wool, without sandals, purse, or script, a long staff in their hand, dependent for food and shelter on the goodwill of their neighbors, Wycliffe's poor priest soon became a power in the land. Their enemies dubbed them lollards, meaning mumblers. They carried a few pages of the Reformer's Bible and his tracts and sermons as they went through the countryside preaching the word of God. The Lollards denied the authority of Rome and maintained the absolute supremacy of the word of God alone. In addition, they maintained that ministers of Christ should be poor, simple, and lead a spiritual life, and they publicly, publicly preached against the vices of the clergy. You need to remember, at this time, <clears throat> are the parish priests 
commonly known to be breaking all their vows, shacking up with women in the village, fathering children outside of wedlock, doing all this stuff, right, that they're not supposed to be doing. You know, living relatively high off the means of income that they are receiving from the church. Among the Lollards, or at least among those friendly to them, were members of the gentry who protected the preachers and enabled them to deliver their messages. Much of the popular poetry of the time reflected views which were in accord with those of Wycliffe's preachers. So again, are they protected by people of means who are sympathetic to their teaching? Yes. Remember in Luther's case that Prince Frederick the Wise protected him from those people that wanted to kill him because he was sympathetic with his teaching. Okay? <clears throat> Persecution was inevitable, vigorous, and prolonged. The bishops could not ignore a widespread move which cut at the roots of their power and denounced some of the accepted beliefs and practices of the Catholic Church. The itinerant preachers were accused of stirring up the peasants' revolt of 1381. The charge was probably ill-founded. The insurrection was a protest against taxation and maladministration. Wycliffe's preachers seem not to have been among the social uh, revolutionaries. However, many of, the, many of the possessing classes frightened by the revolt held them responsible. So in other words, they're sort of scapegoated for this, uh, this situation. Okay? In the reign of Henry V, 1413 to 1422, sweeping measures were taken. That king was vigorously anti-Lollard and a Lollard outbreak in which a knight, Sir John Oldcastle, was involved was ruthlessly suppressed. After the burning of Wycliffe's bones, actions taken against the Lollards continued, but Lollard, Lollardry persisted and seems to have enjoyed something of a revival in the reign of Henry VII between 1485 and 1509. Certainly, there was, there was continued persecution. Lollardly, Lollardry, we're not talking about you, Lolly, okay? Lollardry, Lollardry became one of the... Con became one of the contributory sources of the Eng of English Protestantism. Okay? So, any questions about all that? Now, I didn't, I didn't include it because I thought I'd be out of time by now. But this spreads to the continent. And a certain person, you might have heard of them, named John Huss in Bohemia, is going to be influenced by Wycliffe. And then Huss is going to make his own stand in Bohemia about a hundred years before Luther. Huss is going to be arrested and burnt at the stake as a heretic by the Catholic Inquisition. I don't know if they burn him twice, but I know they, they definitely burn him at the stake for, as a heretic for teaching things similar to Wycliffe and for also advocating for the use of the Bible in the common tongue of German, okay? So this is a period where things start to ramp up. This period here, things are starting to ramp up when it comes to the issues of the Bible and its influence on society. Folks, what, what we are living in right now is a post-Reformation America where the residual remnants of the Reformation are leaving our culture. Okay, our culture, think about who came to the United States initially. They are, almost all of them that came and settled in 13 original colonies were Protestant Christians of different denominations. You know, you, got, you had your Baptists, your Quakers, this and that. There was only one colony that was originally Roman Catholic. Okay, as recently as 1960, there were Americans who didn't know if they wanted JFK to be their president because he was Roman Catholic. Some of you might remember this, okay? And so they thought that if he became president that he would somehow put America under the dominion of the papacy. Of course, that didn't happen, but as recently as 1960, that was things that people were seriously worried about happening in this country, okay? Now, our culture has left, has basically lost 
all the residual influence of the Protestant Reformation on our culture. But all of the, 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 the ascendancy of the Bible into the common tongue literally, literally is a factor that gave birth to the modern world. Okay? And it cannot, be, it cannot be overlooked, especially from the point of view of somebody who considers himself a Christian. Even atheists, even people that are against the Scripture, cannot deny the impact that all this had on the establishment of Western civilization. And that's what the French Revolution was about. The French Revolution was the most atheistic and antagonistic of religion, against religion of all of the so-called revolutions that occurred since the year 1700. They actually wanted to do away with God, totally. In fact, if you look at Diderot's encyclopedia, he lists religion under the realm of superstition and occult, which is a product of the Enlightenment philosophy. Okay, so I can, I'll be done now, but we could talk about this stuff forever. But everybody following that? So what Wycliffe is doing is he's really planting the seeds in English culture for, for, for the Bible to have a, a transformative impact upon the culture of, of England. Okay, Now that's not fully realized for some hundred plus years, but he's starting that movement that is going to be profound in history is, uh, for English-speaking people. Okay? Any questions or comments? I don't know how excommunication started, but I know the power it held over all the kings and people that were um, born around that, uh, in, in, under that culture. Because to be excommunicated from the church meant you lost your souls completely yes. forever. Because you were, powerful. correct, you were denied the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And if the sacraments were a means of grace, in Catholic teaching, and you were denied the sacraments through excommunication, then your soul was basically damned to hell for all eternity. So if you are a king and this pope is threatening you with excommunication, that is a very powerful motivator. The other thing that they had, they had two, they had two weapons that they would use. One is excommunication. The other one was something called interdiction. Do you know what that is? If, if, a, if the Pope put a, a kingdom under interdiction, what that meant was none of the people in living under the dominion could take the sacraments. So that was designed to create great internal rebellion against that leader to get them to capitulate to what the Pope wanted so that then he would restore the sacraments to the people of that region. So those were two of the powers of the two swords that the papacy would use to manipulate political leaders. Interdiction and excommunication. Okay. All right, anything else? Did you guys have a question? No, uh, we're just uh, they're talking about how the Catholic Church still has its uh, tentacles in, in politics. It does. And they don't excommunicate a lot of non-practicing Catholics, like those who are in politics now that are Catholic approve of things like abortion and homosexuality and etc. But they're not excommunicated. So what's up with that? Yes. Well, the church, to my knowledge, the church has not officially excommunicated anybody for a long time for any reason. And I think that is part of their political game. If they start doing that now, there's going to be an uproar and they know it. So I think they still have their tentacles in politics without a doubt. In some places more than others. But yes, for sure. That kind of, that's kind of proof that it's a system of the world or of Satan and not of Christ. Yeah, you sent me that question about the keys of the kingdom, right? I mean, there's no... There is no reasonable interpretation of that passage that leads you to say that Peter was the first pope and therefore all of the all of the catholic all the bishops of rome were the descendants of peter inheriting his apostolic authority that's fiction that's 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 every bit as much fantasy as anything else that's out there that did not happen that's terrible interpretation of that text by the way which we don't have time to get into but yeah 
But that's where that starts. And you understand why that starts, right? Because is the church going through a period early on where there's a lot of craziness going on? A lot of bad teaching, right? A lot of unsound doctrine. What have we seen in this class? Were the manuscripts of the New Testament being corrupted while Paul was still writing them? Right? We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, Paul says, right? He talks about he talks to the Thessalonians about them receiving letters as from us. So what the solution, what the worldly solution was, was to establish one authority that could rule on cases of religious orthodoxy. Now, in the Grace History Project, I have two lessons on the evolution of the Catholic Church. Okay, in other words, how did that system emerge from the first century? How did that system emerge to come to, to become the dominant system? I could share that with you if you want me to. It might be interesting for you to, to listen to that stuff. And I'm sure over time, even though there's been this, uh, I guess, quest to separate from the Roman Catholic Church, Protestant, the Protestant churches have been infected by it still. I mean, there's still some teaching from the Roman oh, sure. Catholic Church. Sure, there is, and there's also a, there's also an open drift now on the part of Protestants to drift back to Catholicism. What what struck me, and what's always about that passage, is what cross reference do you have to anything like that in the Bible? You don't. So that's just, I don't. He says, "Thou art Peter," referring to who? Peter. But then he says, "Upon this rock." I will build my what? He's not referring to Peter, he's referring to who? Right. Himself. Okay, that's what the verse says. It doesn't say what they want it to say. And, and yeah. Peter had just uh, professed his Correct. belief that Christ was the Son of God. It was on that truth that he was going to build his church, right. right? Not upon anything related to Peter. Right. Because Peter was, you know. Peter was Peter. <laughs> yeah. All right. Appreciate your attention. And uh, remember, we will have class next week, but Bud is going to teach, and we'll resume looking at Wycliffe next uh, two weeks from now, specifically looking at his body.